on the open road, I feel so free. There's a sense of freedom that comes when you yes. ride a motorcycle. Yes. It transcends any other activity that I know of, at least for me. If you're a rider, you know what I'm talking about. And if not, all I can say is that if I have to explain, you wouldn't understand. If time is limited, and I really want to get somewhere, I take the major highways. When traveling in the USA, that usually means interstates, which run between all of the major cities down there. But I really am not that fond of big cities. Some of you remember the movie Crocodile Dundee? Yeah. 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 Everybody remembers the line, that's not a knife, yes. this is a knife. But really the best line in that city is where the reporter asks him if he ever lived in a city. And he says, uh, he said, never been to a city. And she says, you've never been to a city? He said, no, cities are crowded, right? If I went to live in some city, it'd only make it worse. And uh, so uh, for, for myself personally, I, I avoid them uh, when I can. I prefer really to ride on country highways and scenic byways, roads that are narrow and preferably have lots of curves, which sometimes means you have to get outside of Saskatchewan. <laughs> the curve here is an on-ramp to the freeway. <laughs> there, there was a moto journalist by the name of Max Burns who's right for Cycle Canada. And he did a cross-Canada trip, and he wrote some articles about it. And I remember that he said in, in one of his articles, he said, if a, if a Saskatchewan farmer tells you that a road is really twisty, he said, ask him if he means two curves or three. He usually doesn't say really twisty unless it's three. <laughs> while, we were, while we were down in Tennessee, actually, it's right on the, the line between Tennessee and North Carolina, we rode by this sometimes known as the tail of the dragon, officially known as Deal's Gap, reputedly the twistiest piece of asphalt in America, 318 curves in 11 miles. <laughs> How many of you have ridden it? Is there anybody else here? Okay, we have, we have several people here, because it's a famous piece of asphalt, and uh, people go there as a destination, 318 curves in 11 miles. And I told the guys down there that it's nothing, guys. In Saskatchewan, we got 11 curves at 318 miles. <laughs> <laughs> Life is a journey, and every journey ends with a destination. While we were down there, we, uh, we stayed for a couple of nights at a place called the Iron Horse Motorcycle Resort. We set up our tents down there in the Smoky Mountains, and they had a plaque up on their wall, and I thought it was so good, I wanted to, to share it with you. I wrote it down so that I could tell you about it. And this is what it said. It said, anywhere you go before you get to your destination is on the way. Think about that. It's pretty profound, actually. Stop and think about it. Anywhere you go before you get to your destination is on the way. Now, that is true for every motorcycle trip. In fact, it's true for every trip of any kind. Now, maybe you say, I just like to ride, I don't care where I'm going. But the fact is, you always end up somewhere. <laughs> Sometimes the destination is unintended, but there's always a destination. Whether you know it or not, you're headed for a destination. Some of you are old enough to remember Johnny Carson. He had a, a famous line, when you come to a fork in the road, <laughs> Robert Frost wrote a poem, The Road Not Taken, and it begins by saying, Two roads diverge. I could not travel on both. And it ends by saying, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. You know, the same thing is true for our journey through life. Jesus said there are two roads. He said that there is a broad road that leads to destruction. And he said there's a narrow road that leads to life. Actually, we should, we should read his words as recorded for us in the Bible. This is in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It's part of the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this is what he said. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road 
that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Whether you know it or not, you are headed somewhere. Either you are on the broad road that leads to destruction, or you are on the narrow road that leads to life. Jesus said that there are many on the broad road. The easy thing is to follow the crowd. People are like lemmings, actually. You've heard about lemmings? Periodically, they migrate. They move in big numbers. They feel safe because there are so many of them going the same direction. But what happens? Ultimately, they end up falling in over the cliff and into the sea. Destruction. But a few lemmings choose a different path. And the result is they live. I want to tell you something today that I want you to engrave on your heart and your mind a very simple truth, but it's, it's so profound. God loves you. He wants you to have a relationship with him that's real and personal. He wants you to have a life that is full and meaningful. But the wrong choices that we make result in a broken relationship with God. Our act of rebellion or our passive indifference toward God is evidence of what the Bible calls sin. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. What are wages? Wages are, are something that you earn Right? Something you deserve. But it goes on to say that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. What's a gift? You don't earn a gift. You don't deserve a gift. It's not given out of obligation. It's given out of love. It's free. The gift of God is eternal life. Our sin separates us from God and puts us on a broad road to destruction. You know, the Bible teaches that we reap what we sow. It says, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. You know, there's a lot of people who sow their wild oats all week and go to church on Sunday hoping for a crop failure. Um, <laughs> doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. Jesus said that those who sow to the flesh, that is our sinful nature, reap destruction. But those who sow to the Spirit, the Spirit of God, reap eternal life. Jesus Christ is the only one who can deal with our sin. Through faith in Him, we take the turn that puts us on the narrow road to life. The Bible says... God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get better first, did he? He just went ahead and did it out of love. There is nobody here, and there's nobody anywhere in this world so bad that Jesus won't give them his free gift of eternal life. On the other hand, there is nobody here or anywhere in this world so good that they don't need it. <coughs> we all need it. We need it bad. Amen. Yeah. Jesus Christ is the only one who can deal with our sin problem. Through faith in him, we take the turn that puts us on the narrow road. You know, Jesus really did die for us. He died to pay a debt he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And he loved us. The Romans nailed him to a cross because that was the most horrible, awful death that they could think of for enemies of the state or any kind of low-down, dirty, rotten criminal. 
when Jesus was put to death, when he shed his blood on that cross at Calvary, his enemies thought they'd got rid of him for good. But three days later, just as he had foretold, Jesus came to life again. And from that day to this, nothing has been the same. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a promise of new life for you too if you put your faith in him. Jesus died for our sins, the Bible says. He was buried. He was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. Did you know that that's the most important thing in the Bible? You know how I know that? Because the Bible says so. It says that this is of first importance. Now, when the Bible says that something's of first importance, I'm not sure what that means to you, but I'll tell you what it means to me. It means that it's of first importance. That's right. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I shared that verse with somebody one time. He said, boy, that's narrow-minded. I said, don't tell me. Tell him. He's the one said it, not me. <laughs> See, it's not enough to know these things intellectually. Sometimes the biggest distance in the world is the 18 inches from here to here. We need to internalize this. It has to be in our hearts. Amen. We must personally commit our lives to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. And when we do, we experience God's love and we begin the great adventure for which God created us in the first place. I believe that some here today may be at that fork in the road, at a place of decision. If you are headed down the broad road that leads to destruction, I encourage you today, I urge you, I beseech you, on behalf of Christ, turn to God. Turn around! The Bible has a word for that. It's called repentance. To repent means to turn around, to go in the opposite direction. It means that you make a U-turn. If you're off track, the way to get on track is to turn from your sin and to turn toward God. To make this turn takes an act of your will. Turning your life over to the control of God, a God who loves you, it is not for sissies. It may be the hardest thing you ever did, but it will be the best thing that you will ever do. And you can do it right now, by faith, through prayer. Prayer is just talking with God. God is not so concerned with the words that you say as he is with the attitude of your heart. I'm going to suggest a prayer. You may want to pray this prayer along with me, silently, where you are, or you can pray in your own words. Pray. Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you are the only one who can get me off the broad road that leads to destruction and onto that narrow road that leads to life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I commit my life to you now as my Savior and Lord. Take control of my life. Make me the person you want me to be. Amen. Amen. You know, the Bible says that those who believe in Jesus, the Son of God, have eternal life from the very moment that you commit your life to Him. If you prayed that prayer today from your heart, I invite you just raise your hand and say, yep, that's me. I'm that. I'm that. I'm saying yes, thank you. God knows what's in your heart. You know, every person that Jesus ever called, he called publicly. You don't need to put up your hand and say, I did it, for it to be real. But I'll tell you what. When you share and let other people know, it will strengthen you, and it will encourage them. Amen. So I... I really want to encourage you. You know, we go to you sang that song about the guy who got baptized. Last Sunday, a week ago today, about 6.30 in the evening, I got a phone call from my grandson, 22 years old, junior. He said, Bob, how's it going? A little bit of small talk. He said, hey, the reason I called you, he said, I just want to let you know I committed my life to God. And he said, I want you to baptize me. 
How, what does that do for a grandfather card, right? It's, uh, it's amazing. That's so good. If, if you've made a commitment today, or you want to talk about it, you're not quite sure what that means yet, you don't quite get it, uh, that talk with you afterwards, just hit me up. And I'd also like to give you a little booklet that, uh, that might maybe help you to, to reinforce and, and understand more about the step that you're taking. I think, Rick, it would be good if you would come back up here. We're going to do one more song, and at the end of the song, we're all going to head outside to the motorcycles. If you've got one of your own, head for your bike, and then we're going to have a, a prayer of blessing on the motorcycles. All right? On the bikes and the bikers. And uh, after that, we'll be ready for barbecue. Right? There's more to me.